Welcome to Canny Climate Dialogues, the podcast at the intersection of international education and climate action. I'm CJ Tremblay, your host, and today we have an episode about research with some of the best in the biz. Very cool. And there's also a special treat in today's episode for you first day listeners. You know, those of you who were eagerly waiting for new episodes to drop. Well, there is finally a payoff for that where there's benefit and you'll hear more about it in our sponsor segment. Also, thank you for being one of our first day listeners. That's always very exciting for us. Um, Okay, now I don't have to tell you, all of our dear listeners, whenever it is that you're listening to this, that the impact research can have on understanding big, complex problems, and honestly, perhaps more importantly, understanding how to take action to solve them. There's lots and lots of research on climate change and lots of research around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Lots of research on education and even international education. But you know what? Not a ton of research on the intersection um, of international education and climate change. But one of the foundational research papers was by friend of Canny, Robin Shields, uh, looking at 2019 data and realized in 2020. And if you're a listener of this podcast, it's likely you've heard us talk about it before because it's really helped many of us in the sector. Uh, and it's transformed my ability to communicate this intersection to so many of my colleagues. So today we are joined by Canny co-host P. Tulia Nikula, who was on our episode two of the pod. So if you haven't listened to that one, 1010 recommend that you go back and do that. It was a really great episode about really one of the what drove Canny to be what it is today. So P. Tulia is one of the co-founders of Canny and she was on that episode with Elsa and it was really great. Um, so she's one of the founders and board members of Canny. She is a senior lecturer at the Eastern Institute of Technology, EIT, in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand, and is an active researcher. Uh, most of P. Tulia's research focuses on sustainable behavior within the international education sector. And she is currently conducting research on organizational motivations and barriers to climate action in the New Zealand context. And she's also co-editing a book on sustainability and education abroad. So all of those things. And she still has time to be with us today. P. Julia, welcome back. How are you? Kia everybody. Good, good. How are you? I am great. Where <laughs> are you joining us from today? You look like you were in an office. I am. Yes. I mean, um, I guess life in New Zealand, sometimes you, you do feel like you're living in this kind of alternative reality, uh, watching news and, and seeing all these lockdowns going on when, you know, life here has been pretty much normal. So, um, so yeah, I'm just at, at work um, and um, joining you today from, from Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. Amazing. It's so nice to have you back. This is uh, your second appearance on the pod, but your first as our canny co-host, which is awesome. Um, so I'm so glad you are here. And I can't, like I said earlier, I cannot imagine uh, this conversation without you. Uh, so tell us, what have you been up to since the last time you were on the podcast? Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of um, when we think about the topic and, and research and sustainability. So um, we're currently editing a book. Um, that's going to be published by the forum uh, that looks at sustainability, so environmental sustainability in, in education abroad uh, with Karen McBride. So it has been actually awesome to see um, the number of proposals we're able to receive for the book um, and very high level um, and high quality um, contributions. So looking at different aspects of, of sustainability. Um, so we had some chapters about uh, kind of carbon um, side of things, as well as case studies within institutions and more kind of systemic level um, policy uh, proposals as well um, from the US and, and, and globally. So it's been great to see that we're actually having this kind of body of emerging research focusing on um, education abroad, international education and, and environmental sustainability. So um, there definitely seems to be a lot that we're going to be able to, to read um 
this year or next year. Um, so new research coming out. So it's been great to kind of see what's um, in the development stages at the moment. It's fantastic uh, that there's so much research coming out. I know. And I know that as we are working on the Kenny website, um, there's going to be a lot of great resources for people. Um, so today's a fun episode. We are bringing our friend Robin Shields back, uh, who was super involved in our first summit, which we did in May of last year. So that is, he did a presentation. Um, so we're going to dig into that, but, um, how did you and Robin, cause you guys have worked together for, uh, as part of this, our summit. Um, so how did you guys come to work together? Um, yeah, so um, obviously, I think a lot of people who who are within the kind of international education domain and interested in in carbon footprint of the sector would probably have seen uh, Robin's paper um, that came came out a few years ago. So um, we definitely wanted to see if we could get him to be part of the the Canny Summit, uh, the first summit uh, we run, and it was you know he was just. You know, yes, I'd love to do it. So it was great to actually see. Him. You never know. With sometimes academics want to, you know, talk to academic community, but it's been great to have him uh, as part of the dialogue um, and with Kenny and other organizations, really talking to you know the practitioners as well. So it's it's been it's been great. Um, and I think you know his his paper has been you know it's been it's kind of a fundamental piece because we don't have a lot of research that has looked at the sector. Um, from, from that perspective. So it's, it, it was great to see that paper, um, come out. Yeah. And I, I can't think of anyone better to talk to Robin with than you. So I'm so glad you're here. Um, and one of the last things I want to talk about is we have talked on a number of occasions. We have weekly meetings at Canny. So this is just like another, it's just a small meeting that we're having. We get two meetings this week. Um, one of the things we've talked about a couple of times that I'm hoping that we can that you can share with our listeners is the concept of a carbon handprint. I think everyone's very, very familiar with the concept of a carbon footprint. Um, and I'm wondering because it's, it's come up on a number of occasions um, and I'm sure it will come up today in our conversation with Robin. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit for our listeners who might be unfamiliar with that term. Mm. Yeah, I guess um, traditionally the discussion has been quite focused on on the carbon footprint. So, you know, what is the kind of uh, negative cost of us, us being engaged in international education activities such as emissions related to, to flights? Um, but the carbon foot, footprint is really thinking about kind of the positives and the influence we can have as well. So, you know, how can we as a sector, how can we as international educators um, take action, for example, by... Um, helping our students to have a better understanding of um, climate change and sustainability to take action later on. How can we have influence, maybe influence our own institutions, workplaces, and change practices. Um, so, so there are multiple ways of, of having this kind of a positive, positive handprint as well. Uh, it might not be as easy to measure as, as the footprint. Uh, so it's not necessarily as, as tangible, but um, I think it's very important not just to focus on the footprint, but also think about well, what are actually the positive benefits of, of international education, and how can we how can we do more um, and integrate and include sustainability uh, and climate action more in in the things we do as well. So, so it's important to have a kind of a more holistic understanding of of that topic. Got it. So footprint, negative impacts, handprint, holistic approach, positive. Uh, weaving of all of the concepts of the sustainable development goals into uh, action, let's say. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, that feels like a really good place to um, in sort of transition and bring Robin into the conversation because he did a lot of work on the carbon footprint, but I think he's quite passionate about the handprint. Uh, and so before we go into that, a just very natural segue, Petulia, you have a PhD, please tell me where this PhD is from. Uh, yeah, I did, um, I did complete my PhD about five or six years ago at, at Oakland University. Um, and it's, 
it has been great to see them as, as our sponsor of this podcast series as well. So, um, and they obviously been really focusing on, on this topic. So um, it's great to see my, my um, old institution um, taking action in this area as well. Yeah, I can imagine as a uh, co-founder of Kenny, it's something you must be super proud of um, and is is so nice to be able to say all the time that uh, you got your PhD from our presenting sponsor, which is great. And we're going to have a few words about them now. Uh, love that very natural and totally unscripted transition provided by P. Julia. Uh, her alma mater is the University of Auckland and their international office is the presenting sponsor of the Kenny Climate Dialogues, which is just so cool for her and also very awesome for us. And there's something that makes today a little extra awesome. And, and this is very cool. We get to do our sponsor segment with our sponsor. I'm joined today by Brett Berquist, Director of International at the University of Auckland. Hello, sir. Hey, CJ. It's really great to be with you. I am so glad you're here, uh, not only because this is delightful, but I also am the one reading this all the time. And we happened to connect last night. Uh, it's a Sunday evening in Auckland, late Saturday night in Vancouver because pandemic. Uh, I thought it'd be fun to hang out and read some ads. So why don't you take your own words for a spin? That sounds cool. Can you please turn up the bass and the reverb to make me sound like that guy who does the movie trailers? <laughs> Here we go. The University of Auckland's international office is proud to sponsor the Canny Climate Dialogues podcast series. New Zealand is a unique place to think about climate through the lens of our indigenous cultures. Leading the world's universities in the Times Higher Global Impact Rankings as we work towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The international team at the University of Auckland share your concerns about climate action and international education. The University of Auckland, answering the world's call. That was awesome. Uh, so in addition to the above, which I have had the privilege of reading a number of times, there is a sponsor bonus to share with our listeners who are streaming this episode soon after they come out, because if you're listening to this before April 19th, we do have something special for you. Uh, the University of Auckland is hosting the Times Higher Ed Innovation and Impact Summit with Penn State from April 19th to 22nd. Brett, can you tell our listeners what the summit is and what they should expect and why they should attend? Yeah, it's going to be a really wonderful summit. And one thing we're really proud of is something that would resonate with county listeners is the first time two institutions are co-hosting the summit and we're 9,000 miles apart. So a really cool thing is that some tracks will be scheduled for the North American um, audience and some for Down Under. So it's great that you can sort of pick and choose which, uh, which track meets your, your time zone and your, at your convenience. This is really the space where universities come together to talk about the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. And you'll hear a lot of different examples of what's going on there. Um, there's also some really interesting new research emerging. For those who listen to the podcast who do international student recruitment, um, there's some new research that the Times Higher will present about how much sustainability is a motivator for international students. Now, it varies quite a bit by market, but it does show that it's becoming increasingly important and one of the criteria that uh, international students look for when they're choosing to study abroad. So log in and join us, and we're really happy to offer you a discount. If you use the code HOST20, that's all caps, H-O-S-T-20, HOST20, when you check out, you'll get a 20% discount for the event. That's awesome. So for those of you who did or have listened before April 19th, that is a special discount code. Also, Brett, our first ever discount code. Very cool. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we will be hearing from you on future episodes, no doubt, and from your team. Uh, and so I guess from one best friend of the Kenny Climate Dialogues podcast, we are going to 
uh, go to another with Robin Shields. So if you've been listening to this podcast or have heard me speak at events, you've likely heard me completely fangirl over our guest today. Robin Shields is a professor of education at Bristol University in the UK. Robin's research and teaching interests focus on applying new forms of quantitative data collection and analysis to study global trends and processes in education. He received his PhD in education from UCLA in 2008. And in 2019, Robin published a groundbreaking study that you heard me talk about earlier on greenhouse gas emissions associated with international student mobility. He's also lovely and working with him has been instrumental, I know, in my climate journey. So it's just a real pleasure that he is able to join us for his uh, first stop on the podcast today. Robin, welcome. How are you? Hi, CJ. I'm doing well. Thanks. How are you? Doing well. Yeah, it's a beautiful day in Vancouver. Uh, Where are you joining from today? I'm joining from a town called Bath in England. It's a small, smallish town, well known as the filming location for the recent Netflix film Bridgerton, or sorry, series Bridgerton. So if if anybody's watched that, you've seen Bath. Um, It's a Georgian city, got a lot of history, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and about 20 kilometers from where I work at the University of Bristol. I, I feel like I'm there. Exactly. That's amazing. Me, haven't I? Oh, it's good. It's so nice to have you here. Um, and the, our listeners would have heard the uh, embarrassingly glowing introduction, best friend of Canny, big fans. Um, I'm super keen to hear from you. And I know we've done like quite a few uh canning projects and climate action and climate justice events together now but this is your first appearance on the podcast yes but i've been listening so i feel well connected to the podcast already that's awesome thanks for listening um and so i would like for our listeners to hear from you your climate story Okay, my climate story. I think uh, perhaps like a lot of listeners, um, my kind of climate story actually begins with international education and international travel and benefiting a lot from that in my own life, I suppose. Um, Like many of us, I've moved around the world quite a bit. So I spent half my life living uh, in the USA, in California, and my another half here in the UK. So I have kind of an international background and that's benefited me a lot in my education. I didn't study abroad, in, interestingly, as an undergraduate, but I did do an internship in Paris for a summer through which I learned a lot. And after that, I, I've worked internationally quite a bit. So I worked in the field of international development for a while, um, got to travel around lots of Asia, which was very exciting. So I've, uh, International travel, intercultural experiences have enriched my life a great deal, expanded my horizons. But I think over the past couple of decades, I've been increasingly conscious that there is an environmental cost to these wonderful benefits that have enriched my life. Um, Books like Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything have drawn attention to the large carbon footprint of air travel. And so that's something that was increasingly or has increasingly been on my mind over the past 10 years or so. In my life as a researcher and an academic, I have also studied uh, international higher education quite a bit, particularly international students in higher education and the uh, many millions of students who go abroad to pursue a degree. And so I, I started kind of seeing a connection between these two things. Working in an institution, uh, like many of us, where more international was always better, I started to feel a little bit uneasy about that. Um, And every time, you know, people said they're going around the world or I was going off somewhere, I started to wonder or ask myself at least, uh, is this worth it? Is this something I should be doing? And there were many great things that came from my international work and collaboration, but there was kind of a gnawing feeling knowing that there was a cost that nobody was really talking about or considering. And so that's mainly how I have come to be interested in climate change and climate activism. And that's probably the the path that's led me here today. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm also super, I think that that also leads to how you came to find Canny. Yes, absolutely. And you were presenter at our first ever summit. I think that Petulia 
uh, was working with you on that. That's right. That was a wonderful experience. Um, so I don't know. Petulia probably knows better than me, but there was a really good turnout, very active audience participation. And I was absolutely thrilled to participate in the first uh, Canny Summit which was sometime around autumn of last year, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Petulia, but I, I think it was around then. Um, I have had a lot of contacts, some former students, some current students working in international higher education. I, a lot of my doctoral students have gone on to work in roles in international offices, for example, and internationalization. And it was very clear from talking to them that, that Kenny and the Climate Action Summit were having a bit big impact. A lot of people contacted me after that. A lot of people who I'm in touch with said, oh, you know, I tuned into that or I participated in the summit and it was absolutely wonderful. So that was my first engagement uh, with Kenny, definitely. But I was absolutely thrilled to participate in the panel on climate justice uh, led by Ine Williams uh, last month. And that was just, you know, really fascinating. Great discussion um, with Andrew Gordon from Diversity Abroad and Melissa Lee from the, the Green Program. So that was another highlight of my experience with Canny, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, and we're so glad uh, to have you this episode on research. Um, I think is going to be really helpful. I know that, and so I think we just can jump right in um, because. I'm, and I'm very glad B. Julia is here uh, to anchor a lot of those conversations um, and answer, sort of provide her perspective. Because um, your research from 2019 has been mentioned a lot. It was instrumental um, in some of, in understanding and contextualizing sort of what I knew about our sector um, in the carbon footprint of just like one part of internationalization. And you shared that the number of students who studied abroad um, for like degree programs in 2019 had the same carbon footprint as like a small to medium sized country like Croatia or Jamaica. So I'm wondering if you can tell our listeners a little bit um, in sort of your words, what your research measured, um, how, and, and also what it didn't include. Yes, absolutely. So I, first of all, it's great to hear that, you know, it's been received and people have heard the message. As a researcher, I'm sure Petulia agrees that's one of the best things you can hear, that people are actually reading your research and maybe doing something differently because of it. So this study, uh, which was published in Journal of Cleaner Production, aimed to just uh, quantify, in some senses, to measure the environmental cost of international student mobility in higher education. There are so many studies written about the benefits, all of which are true. There are many benefits to study abroad and uh, mobility in higher education, but nobody was really talking about the cost. And so for once, I wanted to just make people aware of the cost and to do that with a very detailed uh, modeling, you could say kind of a computation or accounting of the footprint of degree mobility. Students who go abroad, who leave their home country physically, cross a border for the purposes of obtaining a degree. So this includes students um, who are enrolling it in an institution abroad. It doesn't include uh, students who participate in short-term mobility, and this would include a semester abroad, even a full year abroad, um, if they're studying full-time at an institution in their home country and they go abroad for a year, that wouldn't be included here. It's only students who go abroad for a full degree. Um, and as we know, that means it's only capturing a small part of international mobility because study abroad is huge. Uh, many thousands, actually millions of students participate in study abroad activities, which is great, but they're not captured here. So I was lucky in that there is a plethora of wonderful data online available for free that would allow uh, someone like me to make a pretty good estimate of what the footprint of international student mobility would be. Uh, the UNESCO Institute for Statistics collects and publishes bilateral flows of international students. So kind of for every pair of country, every pair of countries, sorry, they know the number of students more or less who are going from country A to country B. And there's also a, a uh, project called Open Flights, which records all the possible flight routes that one could take in the world, uh, 
tens of thousands of them. And taken together, these can give us a pretty good estimate of the carbon footprint due to travel. That student, uh, the main source of emissions will be students' air travel. As we know, air travel has a very high carbon footprint. So that was the main source of data. The other source of data I looked at is what students were likely to produce in their carbon footprint as part of their day-to-day -day life while they're studying abroad. They might move from a country that you know relies on a lot of coal for electricity, somewhere like Australia, I believe, or India, to somewhere that uses a lot more renewable uh, resources for electricity, for example, Norway. And so in some senses, their carbon footprint could go down because of that, or it could equally go up. So using the data that, that's available, I took that into account too. And so I came up with the number that you uh, cited now, about 14 to 34 megatons. And that's that's difficult to get our head around, I think, because it's, it's a big number, it means millions of tons. It's hard to really understand what that could mean. And so one point of reference is to say it's kind of the same as a small country. And, you know, th that suggests it's non-trivial, it's important, but it's also only part, a very small part, we could say, of a very large problem. And so it's probably good not to get paralyzed by this and not to back away from internationalization. That wouldn't be what I'd want, but to start to talk intelligently and maturely about how international higher education can address the climate emergency. Thank you for sort of walking us through that. I think that it's been incredibly um, eye-opening for me, even just to think about what it doesn't include. You talk a lot about your travel as a faculty member. Um, P. Tulia, I know you have that as, as well in your experience. Um, yes, yeah, of course. Of course, you know, you have to always think about, you know, what you can include and one study can only do, um, you know, a, a specific scope. So obviously we'd have emissions related to, to language travel, uh, compulsory schooling. We see also secondary students um, and the student mobility increasing um, as well. Um, but I think it, it was really like a, a, a highly influential piece for, for practitioners as well, because we need something, we need an understanding of where we are to start taking action. So um, yeah, Robin, I mean, it was uh, really well received, I'm sure um, among both the academic community and, and practitioners both. Um, and there's some kind of emerging research that's starting to look at um, study abroad sector emissions as well. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, Stephen Robinson from Champlain College is doing an estimate of carbon footprint of um, US education abroad. Um, and some other researchers who, who are looking kind of into maybe some of the areas you didn't have uh, time to capture in, in your study um, as well. So, um, so that's something. Um, and we talked also about some of the, um, you know, question marks in terms of, you know, how do you actually measure to travel of a student? You know, does it mean that they come to a country once and they go back when they finish with their study or do they travel back home more often? So how do we kind of, and also if they have family and, and relatives visiting, you know, should we kind of count that in, in the, the footprint as well? So there was a paper a few years back by uh, Davis and, and Dunk flying along the supply chain, which really looked at, um, I think from the UK context, how many times students actually go back home during their studies and do they also have relatives and friends visiting? So it's, it's a difficult, you know, you have to decide what is in scope uh, and what is Absolutely. not to kind of think about and, um, and then kind of take the, but it was, it was a great uh, first piece of research. I think it's going to be quite foundational um, and has been as well. So um, it was great to see that paper come out. Um, That's great to hear. And I think you're right about some of those areas that we need to look at things like um, family travel, and you've pointed out some really great research that's occurred uh, in that area. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot to look at still. And I would say that, I mean, one kind of a double-edged sword for a lot of research on climate change is there's a tendency to actually be very conservative in some of the claims we make, because we don't want to seem alarmist. So a lot of my assumptions around um, uh, students travel home, you know, it was kind of once a year or even once every other year. And I, th I think, Petula, you pointed out some recent research suggests it's quite a bit more than that, most likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it, it is just, you know, kind of way, obviously, we have to start from somewhere and then having yeah. a, a more nuanced understanding um, of the footprint. And you're, you're correct. I think a lot of the uh, footprints we have from uh, big organizations and so on, they're definitely not trying to overestimate. They're trying to be more conservative in terms of um, the emissions we have as well. So, um, and one thing as well, I think would be very useful would be for uh, international education sectors in different countries to actually have an understanding of the emissions related to um, their inbound and on outbound um, travel to, because we see that discussion happening um, more and more. I think COVID might have kind of made it a bit slower, but there was an emerging discussion in some countries such as Australia, New Zealand of, you know, what is the footprint of our international education sector and, and really starting from measuring and then starting to think about, well, you know, what can we actually do about it? So. Um, it's a, it's a great um, piece of piece of research. Robin, are you are you interested yourself, kind of taking it further, um, kind of continuing in that same same area, and maybe uh, I would like coming to. up. Yeah, yeah, I, I can say I'm not doing anything actively right now. I, there's been a big disruption to international higher education, as mm. we all know. So I feel like for perhaps uh, for like all of us, the last year has really been kind of in suspense, and I'm waiting to see what happens next. Um, but it's worth pointing out that international mobility in higher education has been increasing for pretty much a century, um, and, and nothing else has managed to stop it along that mm -hmm. time. And so it, it, I think there's a good chance that it will just continue growing after uh, COVID, the kind of crisis of the COVID pandemic is behind us. Uh, I think, as you have both pointed out, there's a lot of things that were out of scope, and faculty travel is something that interests me quite a bit, staff and faculty travel. There's been some good research done at UBC uh, on faculty travel, looking at kind of the benefits uh, for travel for researchers and concluding they're not very great, perhaps in terms of what we actually see. If we look at the, the outputs, the research production of uh, said academics, I think how, but I would look at it perhaps, you know, also at uh, kind of self-measured or self-described benefits. What do researchers see they're getting out of the travel how uncomfortable do they feel about it, I suppose? Do, do they go to conferences abroad and think that was totally worth it? Um, my children will have, will be inheriting a, a world which has some significant problems, but it was worth it for this conference. Or is it more a sense of helplessness? So kind of the psychology behind that, I think would be pretty interesting to look at. Mm. And I think also in terms of international student travel, we're seeing kind of this kind of emerging discussion of, of thinking about the footprint and the handprint. So these are the emissions related to your travel. So, you know, what is, what is the handprint? What are the positive outcomes? Yeah. Um, and even hearing this kind of discussion, you know, trying to value like student A to student B, you know, what is, what is the cost uh, to the environment and what are, what are the benefits? And obviously it's quite a new discussion. So, um, but it's, it's something that's starting to, I guess, happen more often as well. I agree. I mean, and, and that's such an interesting area. I think we need some theorists or some social justice philosophers who can start to look at the, the handprint and the footprint because they're so different from one another and say, how do we kind of think about the ethics of this consumption? There are some really important benefits and some really significant costs. And what's a, a framework that we can use for, for trying, that we can kind of apply in our day-to-day -day lives for ensuring that, that international higher education is as ethical as possible, as socially just as it could be. So I think the ethics of all of this, I'm not much of a philosopher, but I would like to learn more about how we think about that type of problem. I think that was kind of a, like a beautiful uh, conversation and a, a nice place to reflect for a moment, because when we talk about the, you know, the, the numbers, which can be, um, kind of overwhelming and abstract, like 14 to 34 megatons, but like, okay, Croatia and Jamaica in terms of like annual emissions. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And then when you think about like that, that's just the one small part and we just have this tip of the iceberg. Um, and that then simultaneously there's the role of the sector as leaders, right? Like we are educators and sort of that leading by example. And I know that practitioners, um, and staff, um, who I've had conversations with in, in Canada um, as we talk about the, the staff travel and changing operations and 
the <laughs> Robin, what you said, like, oh, did I, did I leave our planet has problems, but it was worth it for this conference. Did I really derive that much out of it? Like asking ourselves those questions, the research may, you know, not have all the answers yet. Cause we're just really starting to realize how much we have to look into this, but these are, these are questions that we'll always go back to in terms of action, right? The climate action network, like these questions are actions that practitioners can ask themselves. And I think that we don't have all the answers yet. And I, as a humble, uh, non-researcher will say, please, provide us this information so that we have something that we can take. Because what I can say is that that report, Robin, and that research is something that I can take is a, is I can take to my uh, superiors or my office or my colleagues and say, this is a small part of a bigger problem, but it's still a part of it. And here's actually the, the numbers. And that's tremendously um, valuable. So it, I know I'm, I'm a huge fangirl and a very big, big user of that research. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, and you both alluded to student behavior, right? We, in our sector, we are very much anchoring, like to center our students, right? We talk about that very often. Um, and I'm, I'm keen to talk about sort of some of the research that already exists um, in terms of um, if maybe we can dig into a little bit more Petulia, what you shared about the international students and their travel patterns, like what can we do to influence, like how do we use that and how can we use it to influence um, their behavior and sort of, you can mm-hmm. share some of the research that exists already. Yeah, I haven't, I mean, I have seen a few papers that have kind of measured um, and just uh, tried to quantify, you know, the travel that international students um you know how many times do they go back home but also it could be how much do they travel in their new kind of destination country as well um but there are also questions of would that travel happen otherwise maybe if it wasn't for study purposes it would be for just tourism as well so um so it is a little bit you know difficult always to say well otherwise this you know emissions and this behavior wouldn't happen maybe they would have actually done the exact same but just for for tourism tourism purposes in some instances as well um so in one of our candy summons as well we had um Anne Campbell and Nguyen from the Middlebury Institute of Interna- um, International Studies talking a little bit of, um, the, I guess, the emerging topic of uh, climate anxiety as well among international students. Um, and there has been a little bit discussion on, you know, is that going to, we see young people who are really concerned and, you know, want um, sectors and, and the leaders to take action. Um, and there has been discussion that in some, you know, destination of sorry, uh, origin countries, students already say, you know, I don't necessarily want to travel some, somewhere too far away because the emissions are going to be so significant. So, um, you know, is this kind of climate anxiety going to have an impact on um, the international student flows? So do students decide maybe in the future to stay closer to home to avoid um, emissions that, for example, would be from traveling from Europe to Australia or New Zealand or um, to so are they going to stay more regional maybe? Um, and I guess the question about the student travel, for example, saying you know somebody comes to UK or US to study and decides to go back home, I guess the question is always you know who's um, also when we think about you know whose responsibility is it? Is it is it to some extent the responsibility of the institution um, or the student? I guess um, what we should always do is we have to think about that handprint. So how can we uh, integrate understanding of sustainability, um, climate science, climate action in education abroad um, and all international education activities to make sure that we really emphasize and amplify that handprint our sector can have um, so, so that's quite important and, and it's basically what we talked, um, before as well. So, um, just one example of some of the new research that should be coming out soon is, uh, from Daniel Greenberg from Earth Deeds and he talks about carbon offsetting and carbon onsetting. So he's really focusing on, you know, how can we really help to uh, educate the next generation, um, about these issues and, and really amplify the handprint we could have 
Um, and we definitely can't, sometimes you kind of really see that the discussion is based on this um, dimension only. People are, well, we have a positive handprint, but we don't have to reflect on our own emissions because we do do, but I think it has to be both. We really have to um, really think about the footprint, but also really see how can we do better in terms of um, the benefits we give to our students as well and, and then to um, our global community. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Petulia said. I think two things that kind of stand out to me there is that, first of all, accounting, counting a carbon footprint is never a neutral objective exercise. And the fact that it involves numbers makes people think that it is. But it's also a value statement about responsibility and where the responsibility for the footprint lies. Is it with the individual student, as Petulia said? Is it with the institution? Is it something that's kind of systemic? And we, and as Petulia said, we, we never know kind of the counterfactual. Um, the, what would have happened if the student didn't study abroad? Would they have traveled anyway? Um, so things are probably murkier in that sense than, than they seem. Um, but I think there's two key takeaways. Um, we might not be able to control the footprint much at the present, but one thing we can do is improve it over time. So we can always compare it to where we were last year and say we're better than we were last year. And that's, that's really significant. And even if we just start to measure it, I would say in most cases, we'll find ways to optimize it. As soon as we see a number and it's publicized to us, we might start as kind of a nudge. I think that's what economists call it, nudge theory, that it will start to nudge us towards doing things just a little bit more efficiently, maybe taking a few less trips, if that becomes an option for us, maybe combining trips, which is my favorite option of all, because it means you get to, to stay abroad longer. Okay, so instead of flying back home and going abroad next month, you find a way to stay abroad just a little bit longer. And I think that's wonderful. Um, and then lastly, as Petulia says, the handprint is another thing that we really can control. And when we talk about student behavior, perhaps the biggest unknown of all is how students might change their behavior over their lifetime. You know, the two or three decades after they graduate, what are they going to do differently? On one hand, if they're like me, they probably love traveling even more than when they started. So they might want to go abroad more. On the other hand, if uh, our education is the best it can be, they might approach travel and the way they live their lives quite differently. And so they might do things very, very differently. They might consume less, they might consume differently. And this could have enormous benefits, but we don't really know. Nobody's measured mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And really to claim that we have to design it embed it into all we're doing uh, in universities, in the curriculum and the design of programs. I don't know if that's happening everywhere. Uh, Petulia could tell us about New Zealand. I would say there's a movement to embedding sustainability that I've seen in the UK, but I'm not sure that every uh, international student gets a significant exposure to an education in is issues around sustainability. So that's something that we could improve on and we could study perhaps, you know, behavior changes that occur over a longer time. Mm. And I, I say it as a two directional, the students are going to be, the young generation is pushing us as well to do better and educating us as well. So um, so it's not just us, us telling students, but you know, yeah, there will point. be a big, yeah. So it will be also some of that moment that will actually come, come yeah. from these young people and, and students to, to do better, um, which yeah, will be more and more important, yeah. And I think we're starting to see that and feel it um, in our episode um, with uh, the University of Strasbourg uh, and, you know, how they're embedding it throughout the business school. And I think I shared that when I was at a business school, that was there was not really any time um, allocated for or any course content with respect to sustainability. And that was but a few years ago. Um, and so but you're feeling the pressure from those sort of young students who are, you know, going on those climate strikes. And um, so there's, there's a tremendous amount of power there, but not the power of the purse strings and to change operations. And when we talk about focusing on practitioners, certainly 
the whole reason that Canny focuses on practitioners is because of the short runway that we have. And those are the people um, and the people listening to this are the people who have the ability to, to make those changes and to reduce the footprint while working on the handprint, which should forever and ever continue to improve. That's the goal. But we also sort of need to take that urgent action on the operations side. Um, and I know that research is tremendously helpful in setting those baselines and demonstrating the impact um, that I think is easy to ignore in our sector, the carbon impact. Absolutely. Hmm. So as researchers, um, Robin and Pichuli, actually you both alluded to this previously. I am, I have questions about uh, for both of you, and there may or may not be answers to this, but I think that the discussion might serve as an interesting indicator of the state of our awareness and our values, sort of you talked about, um, in terms of operations and really about pa the passive numbers, like numbers can be passive part mm -hmm. of research where they... Um, and how university operations, sustainability reporting, um, you've talked a lot about like silos in previous, um, in previous conversations we've had. Um, and, you know, what is included in those calculations of emissions at universities in those reports? And, you know, where might it be, where might the buck be passed a little bit? Yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, but there are silos. There's kind of compartmentalization at an institutional level in a lot of universities. Most universities around the world have uh, taken some steps to declare the urgency of climate change. So, for example, the University of Bristol, I know, uh, was the first in the UK to declare a climate emergency. But I know we also have strategies in place that are looking to increase numbers of international students. And there's a bit of a contradiction there. And I think the way that a lot of institutions uh, handle this is kind of by compartmentalizing uh, these two concerns organizationally into different uh, branches of an organizational chart so that we can maintain both of these kind of truths in our mind and our organizational mind at the same time. Um, so you have sustainability offices in many universities. They'll be uh, reporting on carbon emissions. They'll be looking to improve it uh, in implementing institutional strategies. And you'll have an international office um, and the individuals working there are equally concerned with climate change, but in their day-to-day -day lives, they're looking, uh, they, they have goals and uh, performance indicators around internationalization. And so that those are the incentives they've been given and the direction that they're working in. And so there is much more we could do within the university to integrate uh, kind of these contrasting viewpoints, the organizational hypocrisy, if that's the term you want to use, mm -hmm. and to come to maybe more of a holistic uh, mm -hmm. approach to this problem. Mm. There's, there's definitely more awareness um, and action in terms of, of measuring emissions, um, as we have seen kind of globally, um, and also plans to, to reduce uh, the footprint, which is, which is great. Um, but then what is kind of what is in scope and out of scope. So, so a lot of um, kind of international student travel would always be kind of out of scope as well. So it's not really seen as a organizational institutional responsibility. It's seen as the responsibility of, of the students as we talked, you know, who, who is responsible. That question, uh, my, usually my, uh, my question back has usually been, well, can your international students use your service without traveling? And I guess before COVID, it was like, no while well, they have to be here on campus, I guess now it might be more, yeah, well, actually they could stay home and you know study online as well, um, but it might not actually be really uh, an option that a lot of students would, would prefer. But um, so I guess that question, can you, can you use the service and product without having, having those emissions um, related to it as well? Um, yeah, yeah, good way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so it's it's good, but yeah, I, I fully agree with uh, with Robin um, that there are a lot of tensions, uh, you know, within universities and other higher education institutions. So you have this kind of different objectives. Um, in my own research, I looked at organizations, not higher education institutions, in, but organizations in New Zealand, and and these type of tensions seem to be quite quite typical. So um, you know, there were people who were really 
keen on reducing emissions and, and taking action. And then there were some other staff members or sides of the organization who maybe uh, were less keen. So I was really about that kind of overall leadership uh, shown as well, but also the um, thinking about how can we manage this kind of tension. So they are, uh, they exist. So what do we do about it? You know, what are, what is our plan to, to deal with um, this kind of issue? So it's, it's quite important as well to be explicit about it and really kind of think about, well, there's a tension here. So how do we, how do we justify our actions, uh, understanding A and B and C? Um, so I think that thinking and, and having more collaboration between the sustainability officers and the international offices to kind of, for both of them to have a dialogue and understand uh, what both uh, departments are doing would be quite quite important as well. Um, it would be very nice to see a research looking at really these tensions within universities, especially focusing on the international office and then the sustainability um, aspects. And that's definitely something I'd, I'd like to see in the future as well. It's amazing how much just those conversations, anecdotally, obviously, <laughs> from the extent of the of what I can share, but anecdotally, it's kind of amazing to hear those conversations where uh, some I have a relationship with someone I know at a sustainability department who actually has no idea how international operates. And then knowing the same person in international who has no idea and has never really talked to the person at uh, their sustainability office who has no idea how they can help them or um, how this is, you know, they think that the sustainability department's just about like plastic straws, plastic bottles and buildings and commuting. And there's, there's so much um, collaboration that can be, can be done. So that's really interesting and certainly something that we're going to dig into and in future podcasts but robin is that some do you ever engage with the sustainability team at your institutions do either of you actually that's a good question um on the spot (laughs) yeah yeah, actually no and i think that's a really uh that would be a fruitful thing to do Uh, maybe there's a lesson there that academics should be involved perhaps within their own institutions at uh Mm -hmm. (laughs) promoting some of their research and uh, changing practice where we work before we kind of publish it more widely. Mm-hmm. So no, and I'm not aware, you know, I couldn't say there is, or I couldn't say there isn't a link between um, these two offices at the institution I work at. I could say that you often come across strategic university strategies that seem kind of mutually incompatible a bit. And you mm-hmm. always kind of wonder about how do we kind of square that circle, if that's the right phrase. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I don't, how about you, Petulia? Um, well, just talking about the strategy, so I did um, do a little review of um, for, for a study about New Zealand um, international education strategies <clears throat> and also Australian to look at, um, you know, how much emphasis has there been on kind of economic sustainability, social sustainability and environmental sustainability in those, those documents. Um, and it was definitely... Um, until quite recently, it was really focused on those kind of economic sustainability. We need this income, and and then the social sustainability aspect seemed to seem to really get much stronger. So there was really a lot of focus on international student well-being, making sure that communities uh, were seeing value in having international students and the benefits of it. Um, but the environmental sustainability so far has has really been missing from that whole discussion, you know, how does it fit within the strategy? And it hasn't really been discussed as a, as a risk or anything else. It's, it's, you know, a little bit of focus on, oh, yeah, we should probably talk more about climate change and environmental sustainability to students, but um, it's still marginal. I think we'll be seeing it more and more uh, in the future. Uh, so we have more of this kind of full understanding of sustainability. So, um, but yeah, it's it's still obviously uh, probably quite limited in in a lot of other countries as well uh, within the international education discussion. I guess one thing as well, um, thinking about international um, offices and and what they can do as well, because we, they might be kind of stuck with their own, own emissions. I mean, they can do a little bit to to reduce their own kind of marketing related travel and other kind of operational travel, but um, you know they don't really have control over. Uh, airline technology and you know the emissions related to to airline travel Uh, but also they can also think about what I also found my research was that a lot of these uh, organizations I interviewed they were really 
they were active, they were externally influencing. So they were influencing um, their industries. So we could see international offices also taking a role influencing their universities, other you know, parts of the universities to take action um, as well outside, outside as well. So it doesn't just have to be trying to do, you know, what you can do in your own bubble, but you can also do more about just speaking about it and, and trying to push, you know, this is an important topic um, so that external influencing has to be part of it as well and can sometimes be more important than actually what you're able to do within your own, own area um, and office. That's an excellent point. It's kind of the margin for improvement is sometimes not within your own office, but the best thing you can do is to influence somebody else, either elsewhere in the university or outside the university. And I think particularly with the latter, we don't see enough of that. If you look at higher education journalism and marketing, there's a lot of institutions that position themselves as leaders in creating kind of clean technology or green technology. They don't show us as much about what they might do to increase the uptake of that technology. So is, are there actually organizations that are reducing their footprint because of what's gone on at a university? And it doesn't actually have to be, you know, a new form of energy or biofuel or anything like that, a more efficient solar panel. It can be organizational improvements. It can be the way that, you know, uh, companies might handle, look at commuting, uh, look at how they use the office, all types of things like that, behavioral changes can sometimes accomplish much more than technology changes. Mm. Um, so that's really interesting because I know the research that you have done, Petulia, is not necessarily related to higher education institution, but I think that there's a lot to be um, gained from that in terms of you talked about like the tensions and the benefits, but businesses as activists and institutions can sort of take that same uh, mindset as um, Robin just mentioned. And I think, was it Robin or P. Tulia when we were talking about the sort of McKinsey research and their reporting about, and we, okay, yeah, they're not an international operation, but that's kind of how we can only do so much to a certain point because of the technology. Absolutely. Yeah. So McKinsey, just to give everybody some context, uh, is somewhat like a university. Some people call higher education a service sector uh, industry. I don't know if I'd use that language industry yet, but we're similar to a company like McKinsey in some ways. We, we employ people and we use buildings. We don't really produce anything tangible. We just kind of draw upon people's minds. Um, and so McKinsey uh, does carbon reporting and they estimated that 82% of their company's carbon footprint is due to air travel probably conferences and even more so meeting clients and things like that, business development. And so it shows that um, if we don't take that into account, if we just look at what we're doing on campus, we're really missing kind of most of the iceberg. We're looking at the tip of the iceberg and missing everything else. And it's fairly easy for universities actually to look good if we take this very limited view. Um, universities are fairly well resourced compared to uh, other companies, even though it doesn't always seem like it. So we can invest in clean building technology. We can build new, cleaner buildings. Um, we, we can purchase renewable energy. So we can actually bring what's called our scope one and two emissions. Those are emissions that we produce ourselves kind of directly. We can bring those very close to zero quite cheaply and efficiently. What we really can't address too easily yet are these systemic issues, the scope three emissions, mm -hmm. a lot of which are our dependence on uh, air travel. As Petulia's kind of thought experiment shows, if people can't use your service without this, it's actually kind of part of the service. Yeah, so I, I found that really helpful in our last episode, we talked about conferences being sort of necessary, like my job, if there's a conference, like to do my job, I kind of have to be there, but I have no power over determining whether or not it happens. So there are these, you know, there are these sector leadership roles where um, that can happen. And so we, you can look at external non-sector research or reporting like the McKinsey report or for the conferences, there's a report um, where sort of, it was like astronomers of Europe uh, held a virtual conference, which was 3000 times smaller of a carbon footprint when it was done yeah. virtually and increased access. Right. So it's the research that we're doing in the sector is tremendously valuable and resonates 
I think a lot. And that's why you're, you're hearing Pichuli and I say like, that was really a groundbreaking sort of just starting to understand the scope of the carbon footprint that this sector has, but then there are other sort of resources that we can draw on and share. And so we shared a lot of stuff today and we will um, be sharing as I've, I've said before, we're, we're updating the Kenny website very soon. And uh, we're hoping, and part of that will be a resource library where we share um, a lot of the research that we've, we've talked about today um, so that people know where to go and can use it um, to start establishing baselines and sort of making the case. Um, And so this has been an incredible discussion and I want to thank you both, um, but for being here, Um, but I'm hoping to just get some like, final words of wisdom and action for our listeners from um, each of you. I'll start with you, Robin. Okay. Um, First of all, thank you, uh, CJ, and thanks to Kenny for the opportunity to partake in this discussion. It's been really interesting and a lot of great ideas. But one thing I would want to highlight um, to most of the listeners is that they have a lot of agency and a lot of power, and they can change things at their universities. Um, Universities particularly in what we might call neoliberal contexts where internationalization is high and, and it has you know, some revenue attached to it, have a lot of voice in terms of how programs are developed and how the university shapes strategically. And so you should use that if you're listening. Um, when a program's being developed, don't just think about uh, how a school or a faculty might look at the demand that exists, but maybe look at the demand that should exist. Don't look at preparing students for jobs that exist, but prepare them for jobs that should exist. Um, And I think that's a really powerful way to perhaps be better at internationalization, to be a little bit more forward thinking, and also to respond to the climate emergency, to take action, which is what we're about. Thank you, Robin. And P. Tulia, our our canny co-host, why don't you you take us out for some final words of um, wisdom and action for our listeners? Um, I always, when we talk about this topic, I always want people to remember that we have the footprint and the handprint. So it has to be kind of a holistic understanding of the topic. Otherwise, you know, we just see one, one part of the picture. Um, and for any listeners um, who are interested in taking, taking action, as, as Robin said, uh, think about, you know, what is your kind of circle of influence uh, and circle of control. Uh, you may not be able to change national level policies or even your own institutions, but you can do things within your own, uh, own life, your own families, as well as your own kind of organizational circle to, to influence those that are close to you. Uh, and then that's a good, good place to start. Um, and I think it's great to have this kind of discussions where we bring academics and researchers uh, together, together with the practitioners as well to discuss these topics because we can, it's a two, two directional learning. So I learned a lot just talking to, to people who work as practitioners um, and just to having that dialogue is, is really important to see how we can uh, complement each other and our understanding of, of the issues and, and what's happening within the sector as well. Well, thank you so much to both of you. I feel like every time, uh, whether it's in meetings with Petulia or at uh, panels with Robin, I just feel like I'm constantly learning from the both of you. Um, and so I, I'm sure this was incredibly uh, valuable um, and insightful for our listeners. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. And this was really lovely and fun. And so to our listeners, thank you for spending uh, some time with us. We're always deeply appreciative of you taking the time and I, we will, we'll talk to you next week. The Canny Climate Dialogues podcast is engineered by Diego Mendez, who is based in Vancouver. He edits these episodes together, making us look and sound super professional. And also he uploads these episodes to wherever you listen or watch this podcast.